And so this is going to be a real free flowing conversation, uh, just like the last one was. And, um, you know, I think it's good that way. We were, you know, really real folks as we always are. And, um, you know, we're, we're going to miss Natani today. He can't make it. But Natani really uh, ended the last conversation in a great way when we talked about uh, climate justice, that uh, as Lakota people, as indigenous people, our lives have always been around that balance <clears throat> and that striking that uh, having justice for the environment and how we stand in protest now for the environment when no one else does. Uh, he was really powerful in his statements and, and we're gonna miss him today and I hope he's doing all right out there, uh, our, our little brother. So um, yeah, you, you two just had a conversation and uh, it involved around um, uh, incarcerated, our incarcerated brothers and sisters. And it's um, the day, what's the day called? Day of empathy. The day of empathy. Yeah. And I think it's important to, to re-spark re that conversation because all of our relatives, uh, it's all of our families, you know, deal with uh, one level or another of our relatives being incarcerated and the effects of their, of the society on our lives during, before, during, and after that event. I would uh, thank you for that, Joe. Lila Tanya Wachianke, Ake, Wawincha Blake, it's good to see you again. Najaha, uh, Najaha doesn't sit still very long. Look at she's driving in the car right now right. as we speak. So uh, it's really good. It's always good to see you guys. Um, and I, sorry I had to dip out of the last conversation a bit early, but speaking about. Um, defending resistors of extractive aggression is what we can kind of call that. We saw that at Standing Rock with the No Dapple project. And as, it, as that stands right now, there was supposed to be a hearing the last time we spoke. I believe, right. I believe we, we might have done our conversation on February 10th or, or something to that effect. There was supposed to be a federal court hearing on Fe uh, February 11th having to do with the Dakota Access Pipeline and the fact that oil is flowing through there right now illegally. The, 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 the judge, uh, the, the appellate court has said, look at the, the Army Corps of Engineers issued that permit without, due pro without, without the process due for environmental review. Is that Shamar back there, by the way? <laughs> what up, young man? <laughs> Good to see you. Uh, so so th they issued that permit w because President Trump told them to do that. Right. And, and, the, and the appellate court said, look, that was wrong. We're going to vacate that permit, which means that oil is flowing through there illegally, even though they kind of let it still flow. Yep. That's because there's a lot of political pressure and the extractive industry controls a huge huge lobby um, but but if we keep up the frontline presence and the advocacy that we're doing through our networks whether that's through media as you can see somehow I, i'm going from being the most rezzed out uh want to be public persona like we we're, we got a studio going up in here you know what i mean like it's it's going down it's happening and uh I was able to do Day of Empathy uh, from this studio. We've got I've got a, a weekly webcast called Cut to the Chase. It's just kind of a brief overview of news and, and things like this. But we always uh, we have to support each other in all of these efforts. You know, Joe, you've got a, a, a tall order with deploying a 235 watt mega farm. Like that's no small task here, okay. and so. We want to bring all of our resources to bear to help you out with that. Um, Yanajaha has been doing uh, revolutionary healing along with others. You know, you can talk about that. I don't really, I, I missed that. I was not able to make it to that, but I thank you for continuing that struggle because we, we're all in different stages of kind of taking scope of, of what we're doing, the work we're doing, how we're spending our lives. And really, what kind of what kind of legacy we want to see? And we're fortunate to be in a in a in a position in a in a perch to be to be able to 
take you know stock of that or assess that. And so um, I'm happy and encouraged to join the discussion today. Um, I don't know. I, life happens so fast. I mean, what was it? A month ago we were online together. Just like that, it's gone. Mm -hmm. and that that seems like yesterday. And and so uh, I would like to, I guess, just you know, as as an end to my introductory remarks, um, encourage people to keep the pressure on the Biden administration, because they, they won't cut the $2,000 checks. They're trying to cut them to $1,400. Next, they're gonna be trying to just send everybody commods in this country. <laughs> we elected this guy. You know, none of us have to be beholden to the Democratic Party, but whoever the president is, they have to know they can't ignore us. So I just want to, uh, you know, end my introductory remarks with, with that. Um, I see everybody working out there to keep the pressure on this current president. Uh, and we happen to, the Democrats happen to control the Congress and the Senate, but we still can't get things done. So something's, something's a miss out there. That's true. That's so true. How sister. Hi. So, um, a part two watch day. My name is Janaja Halone Wolf. I'm Ogallala Lakota in black. And um, part two, we had a really great discussion last time and I'm happy that we're on this time. Um, so yeah, we just did an amazing event. I unfortunately was in the hospital um, battling lung cancer. So I was having uh, major chest and back pain that, that led me into the hospital for two days. And there's still, I have to do more testing to figure out like what is causing the chest and back pain. It might just be the cancer that's in my lungs that's just expanding against my my um my rib cage a little bit so it gives me um pain um but i you know i just want to acknowledge chase for you know for hosting and moderating it especially at the last minute but it's this is not our this is not our first rodeo when it comes to last minute um call to actions and things to do <laughs> chase is all like oh what are we about to do i'm like i need you on cnn <laughs> I need you on Fox. <laughs> I, Yanazaha just plugs in like the Matrix, plugs something into the back of my neck here. <laughs> I do. So, so Chase was ready to go, and, and I, you know, and it's really a blessing to to have Chase in my life uh, for for that because he's always ready to. All right, let's go. Let's do it. Let's, you know. So yeah. it's, it's it's a blessing. But um, day of empathy. So. I got plugged in with Van Jones, um, Van Jones from the, he's a news correspondent with CNN. And uh, as a matter of fact, Jay-Z and him hooked me up with Van Jones um, to be on his tour that he was doing. And I ended up doing two dates with Van. And Van has an organization called Dream Corps. And what Dream Corps is, is basically on criminal justice reform. Um, he actually, he probably got a lot of pullback, but a lot of people was pretty happy as well when he worked with the Trump administration to be able to um, pass a bill to get a lot of um, a lot of people out of prison, which was those that were on certain drug, you know, drug, I forgot, what was the name? The First Step Act. He was able to get the First Step Act passed. So a lot of people that was in there for drug um, offenses, they was able to be released. And that was off of the, um, the hard work of Van Jones, the Dream Corps. And um, Kim Kardashian happens to be a part of Dream Corps, as well as a slew of other celebrities. Um, but Kim Kardashian, I must say this, is that she really is invested on, um, pr um, on prison reform. And she is um, she's usually sometimes on some of our calls and everything. And so it's, it's really good to be a part of this, um, this coalition, this family. And so they're a partner of ours with Indigenous Peoples Movement. And this is our second day of empathy. Joseph, you did it for the first year. You and your right, wife right. did it in yeah. North Dakota um, for the day of empathy. And so um, we did it um, this time via Zoom because of COVID. And, um, and so we had Chase and we had Ruth Buffalo. And then we had my nephew, Jacob. Jacob is from Pine Ridge and he was um, he was looking at 10 years in prison for a nonviolent offense. Right. Um, and it was um, their, his story for him to share his story as well as another sister that was able to share her story of her, of her brother that was murdered in jail. You know, we hear these stories a lot. And I think that for me, 
um, having this access to people like Kim Kardashian, Van Jones, the Dream Corps, and there's even the legislation that they're connected to. Mm -hmm. When I share our story of what's happening in just North and South Dakota alone, that there is more pe there is more Native Americans that are in prison than there are free in North and South Dakota. And so when I share these stories, the you know, I was like, Van, we need resources in North and South Dakota. And he's like, I don't know. Like, I don't, yeah. even him, they, they get overwhelmed by the information. And I'm like, how do you get overwhelmed? You were looking, you're working so, you know, you're working so hard in the black and brown community, mm -hmm. you know, and they're just like, because of the fact that we are in red states, a lot of places in Indian country are around mm -hmm. red states. Um, and they are around um, borderline racism, white supremacy, not enough attorneys, you know, to be able to be willing and fearless to fight for Native people in, in, especially in North and South Dakota, we don't see that. And so I think that it's a, and in a lot of, a lot of these attorneys do not know, and they're not taught Indian law at all, you know, so that is very foreign to them. I know some of the attorneys that I spoke to with Dream Corps before we did our day of empathy, they was like, you know, I know they say when I went to law school, they just, they didn't teach us Indian law. So we don't, we heard about it, but we don't know. And I think that, that we need to really push for natives to be able to get into the, in Indian law and to be able to go to the native communities to be able to fight. We need to free all of the Native Americans that are in prison on nonviolent um, offenses. And it, because it's so sad that, you know, my cousins are being, are looking at 10 years or seven years just for stealing something from a store, you know, um, or for just any nonviolent offense. And I think that it's, it's, it, and it's tiresome. And I, and as I was hearing, even with Joseph, when you all did your day of empathy, Chase, when we did our both of our day of empathies in South Dakota, I'm sitting there because I'm solution based. I know it's beautiful to hear our stories, but I'm solution on like, okay, how can we get to solutions to provide the resources for mental health, for transitioning, as well as for more legal support. And it always gets me frustrated, like, man, we don't have enough, you know? And I think that that is something that's really key and important for us to be able to provide business councils or getting people that we have people that have their doctorate that are native, that are in, that's learning about psychology and all that. What do they need to, what do we need to support to provide more resource centers for transitioning from prison into back to the community, to mental health, as well as um, more legal support, you know? So that is something that, uh, that, that um, they have empathy moving forward that I really, really need support and help in because I don't want to continue. It's a great platform and all of that, but I think it's important for us to, um, while, when we have these platforms to also begin to like start pulling on resources to, um, for our people to be able to go to, you know? You know, sister, when you're talking about this, it's, it's after the fact. And a lot of it is, it's going to happen. And kids grow up, people make mistakes, kids are learning, but you know, here at home, that mistake, that learning can land you a federal bid. And kids don't even know that, you know, per se. And, and at home too, you know, both homes, East Coast here, um, in, 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 in rural communities and in urban communities, I think that level of education, everybody knows at home taught, but I mean, it's not taught in school. This is the law that you live with and this is the circumstances and the consequences of what could occur if this happens and if that happens. It's, it's, it's unfair uh, to us that we have to learn the law or should teach our kids the law uh, as a sense of defense to be, uh, I wanna say proactive so that when you have to be reactive, you can be active in your defense but you know, looking at solutions like you were talking about there, I think is really important preventatively, but it's finding those resources to train, not to train, but to educate uh, the laws in which we've, we've had to live. So they've been 
turned, I don't want to say against us, but they have been turned against us. The laws have never been in our favor. They've always been there to prosecute us and keep us in a position, either keep us redlined in redlined communities or keep us redlined on reservations so that the rest of the resources and wealth of this country can be enjoyed, not by us. So in this conversation, you know, that we have about the parallels between black and brown, I think that that really comes, resonates through as something that we can see um, that needs to happen across the country, but that's getting, like you said, into your local legislation, whether it be the school boards and having that effect in red states. And that is a very steep hill. Joe, let, I want to jump in uh, just because when you're speaking there and when Yanajaha y- is, is, is mentioning um, the amount of people in black and in, in indigenous communities, basically even poor white communities, anybody outside of property and capital owning white males, European males, uh, everybody outside of that demographic is charged with some crime whenever they commit a wrong. You know, if you're if you if you have money, you can sometimes skirt the 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 grasp of the justice system. And I say that because I, I don't get in the courtroom like a lot at all that's i'm not like a a litigator or a practicing attorney inside the courtrooms but you know when it's when it's a relative or a loved one like i get we get we get those calls i know yanajaha gets those calls too we need legal representation because the criminal justice system i was just going to say i I got a call because a, a young juvenile they're trying to label him as a delinquent because they joyrided some golf carts and it's probably something that you know might not even end up inside the court system if you got if you got money or if you're white or both in this country. Um, but since the inception of the United States, since slavery was implemented on African indigenous people, and since you know all of our lands were were taken and, and are still occupied. You know, this country is still on stolen land. Mm-hmm. The, 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 and, our, and our country is finally at a place where we're okay with, with telling that truth. We don't have to feel like we're, we're entering some controversial space just because we want to recognize that the criminal justice system was built with our bodies by imprisoning black families and indigenous families. And, and usually it was... The, the, the black man and the indigenous man uh, that, that were taken out be, because they, they presented threats to that, that, that power dynamic of white males. And, you know, we could spend more time on that, but I, I will just say that the 13th Amendment purported to free the slaves. And it did, but also the 13th Amendment says very clearly that slavery and involuntary servitude was outlawed except in cases where prison crimes are committed right so they're basically legalizing slavery and and tra- yeah changing the form of slavery and the numbers bear it out like i don't know the numbers for the black community but indigenous communities in south dakota for sure like the numbers are grotesque just in rapid city alone 12 percent of the population and 54% of all inmates in this county are native. And, and we're losing them at the Department of Social Services level, the juvenile delinquency level. As soon as there's a criminal justice contact made, then they, the, those ideas are forming in our young brothers and sisters' heads about how they should relate to those authorities. And so we mm-hmm. need we need to promote healing and we need to get to the root of you know, what is causing these discrepancies. And a lot of times it is, they're just symptoms of a foreign poverty culture. So I I just, I want to say about that much. I really like you touched on that foreign poverty culture because we did not have that culture as indigenous people, as, as African people, indigenous to Africa, communities took care of one another. So this is something that was placed upon us in order to keep us, um, you know, to keep, keep populations undesirables, whatever you want to say off to the (laughs) side. Um, And I hate to use that word, but you know, you got to look at it for what it was. And, you know, when, when, um, 
when when uh, slaves were freed, now they had to, had to do something. So they had to come and be Buffalo soldiers to kill us. Mm. You know, the Cherokees down in Georgia tried to be, a, a, and they were very good at it. They evolved to what was happening around them. They started their own government in that way. And then they were murdered for it because they were doing so well. They did it so well. They became a threat to the, the Georgian government and, you know, so led to the Trail of Tears. But these are the things. And so those things that occurred, you know, the, people will say, well, you know, natives had slaves. And so it's that back and forth. That's the small minutia of things that occurred to us in our survival to exist. And those are things that we need to wipe away because they come up as barriers or obstacles in our discussions and seeing one another, I feel, right. <clears throat> respecting our struggle and fight that it's real important that we unify our message, we unify our fight, we unify our numbers, uh, not just as native and black, but also Mexican, you know, so that we can really get this act together because what's occurred with us, the, the whole categorization of, of us as separate cultures due to race and economy and through legislative policy has done a great job in, in keeping us in separate boxes. So, you know, coming to a place where we need to unify, I, you know, I think is a great point to start to think about and how we educate one another, the similarities, not the, the differences, but these are the problems that we all face when it comes to the law. That's the commonality of it all. But one question that popped up and, and I'd like to, you know, hand us to you and Asda, uh, to start the conversation is a uh, question came up is how do we reframe the conversation around defunding the police redistribution of resources for mental health, education, rehabilitation? I think that um, re defunding redistribution of the funds is really important. Um, we have I want to share something. There is um, a friend of mine by the name of Haroon. He just passed away last week. Um, mm -hmm. He was a, he was the founder of Street Rumors. Street Rumors is an organization in Atlanta. Of, um, and every single morning, he will wake up and mm -hmm. take young people to and fro from school. Um, because of the fact of whether, you know, they were being bullied or trying to be pushed to sell drugs or do drugs. And um, he got over 300 OGs um, from gangs to be able to do a peace treaty. So in the city of Atlanta, in the past several years, the reason why you don't hear about gang violence in the city of Atlanta was because of Haroon and the street groomers. Um, when we, in Atlanta, Georgia, we put together um, a campaign to redistribute the funds, to defund the police and um, to the city council. And one of, one of the things that I put at the table to the city council was the fact that you have organizations like street groomers that are, um, that are cleaning up the community. Grassroots. That's what the police should be doing, but doing it in a way of community serving and involvement and and and, and the police are um, are not doing that here they're they're killing us. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there should be funds that could go towards community based organizations that are respected by the community to do the job of what the police should be doing. You have community um, community cleanup. You have, you know, there's so many people that I would say that what we saw during COVID was the people helping the people. Right. The government did not help us during COVID. It was so many of us that was doing feedings, you know, that, that were giving out food, giving out PP supplies by raising funds. That right there just goes to show how, how the government neglected us neglected us that we had to be able to lean on each other. So because of that, because of that fact in every single city, we saw that then yes, the money that is going towards the large amount of money that is going towards the police department, that some of the, a lot of that money should be redistributed to the community that have stepped up, especially in the most time of need. You know, there's a sister by the name of Alicia Martin. She's Navajo from the Navajo nation. And 
what she's done for the Navajo people, I mean, from sunup to sundown to make sure that they're having PPP supplies, to make sure, I mean, PPE supplies, to make sure that um, they're having food, they're having all of that. And she did that all off of donations and her own car and gas and then, and, and, and and all of that and there who is there to be able to assist her financially you know i feel that there needs to be um we have to demand for that we have to demand for the community to um you know for the for the people to tell these city councils and the mayor to redistribute these funds there's so it's too much money that goes towards and um towards the police department and all and all they do is continue to harass us to kill us, to to um, and to judge us, you know, and um, and we don't need we don't need that treatment anymore. Also, it's the uh, the money that we spend on our military, and yeah. and you know, it's just we bomb people just so that the sellers of those bombs have more contracts to fill, and so that's it. Doesn't matter who's in the presidency. The grassroots always has to hold the system accountable because not only once you get into those circles, are you beholden to whoever's filling your campaign coffers, you spend all your days dialing for dollars and, and hitting people up for campaign contributions so you can get elected again, you you get lost in the sauce. And when, when Yanaja is talking about... Uh, that organization that's at work right there in Atlanta, uh, um, we mutual aid. That's the only way a lot of communities survive in Rapid City. Camp Mini Luzaha, which is is led by Mark Tilson and NDN Collective, uh, is is definitely helping to make that happen. But you also have uh, Natalie Stites Means. And candy brings plenty. Muffy, F Muffy Musso, and Felipe De Leon cooking food for hundreds of families, delivering it, like just making it happen. And that th that sort of mutual aid is is what the the corporate state, the police state, doesn't doesn't contemplate. And they're not designed to protect our the people or the land. For, that's for damn sure. Like they're designed to protect the capital, the money, and the property of the people that have money and property. For the longest time, that hasn't been us. Like uh, just the, just yesterday, when we talk about symbols, renaming symbols, yeah. why is it? Why is Stone Mountain important to important. focus on? Why is Mount Rushmore important to focus on? Not the least reason of which is because the same dude was hired to sculpt those places guts and borglum he jetted from storm stone mountain a member of the kkk comes into the black hills and carves mount rushmore and then right up this right up the highway devil's tower as soon as deb holland it became apparent that she was going to be the next secretary of the interior wyoming senators passed some sort of little resolution that protects the name devil's tower and doesn't allow us to change that so symbols, the way we know ourselves, the way we name our lands is extremely important. But it's just basically this century where our people are finally stepping into a place where we're comfortable, we're authorizing ourselves, we're recognizing each other's power. And it's, a, it's very, it's, pow, it's good medicine. At the same time, Trump loses because Atlanta turned out, Georgia turned out. Trump loses. He's got no more. He's got no pulpit no more. He's trying to drag his dead horses to the trough and make them drink. And and at CPAC, the the Conservative Political Action Committee, you saw these these guys roll out a freaking Nazi stage. Their stage is is designed in the shape of Odin's rune, which is a symbol just like the swastika. It's like the like skinheads are using this stuff. And and CPAC is jumping on that train. So. There's a there's it, we've always been in a in a in a an undeclared conflict, undeclared just meaning mainstream doesn't recognize it, but we're losing people to it, to the system, to the criminal justice system, as well as they're they're trying to encroach on our lands like constantly. They they ain't stopping. Marty Jackley's running for attorney general again in South Dakota, uh, so and, and and coincidentally he's now the prosecutor on 
the Oscar Hayat case, which is it's crazy to think about. Wow. You know, it, it's funny where you bring up CPAC and the little golden uh, statue of Trump that they're all standing next to and posing by. Talk about idolatry, a gold. I mean, it goes back to the freaking Moses Ten Commandments movie is what's your religion and do you really believe you're Christian? You know, walk the talk. But, you know, a, a second part of this question is how do we help others view this differently so they can see what's going on and, and find a solution. So it's like turning those red states, I'm gonna say turn red states blue, but help each other see the humanity in one another. And a lot of it is occurring now, you know, particularly in these last, uh, there's been a, a big a flourish, I would say in the last five years, you know, uh, with, with social media, you know, being that platform to distribute the message broadly, widely, people are seeing things in real time without the filter of major media, corporate media. You know, to say this is the story you're going to hear. People were seeing real story, seeing real human humanity happening. So, um, yeah, we just we really need to, to change. I don't say change, but expose people's souls to what's happening to their brothers and sisters. Yeah, you know, um, you're absolutely right, um, Joseph. With with Indigenous Peoples Movement, you know, one of the things, and you know, you both of y'all know, we're at the beginning. We was talking about like indigenous means original inhabitants of the lands and we're going to decolonize the way people view indigenous and that was very difficult for many people because i was like there's indigenous people in africa right. in asia in south america in australia so basically in so many words indigenous is just really a lot of people of color <laughs> and, and and to be able to um, remove those borders that colonialism and even ourselves put ourselves around of, of seeing um, the injustices and seeing all of that. And I think that, you know, right now we are at, we got verified. We're at over 200,000 followers on only on Instagram alone. That's not including Facebook and, and, and Twitter. And we're about to create an app. And this app, is going to like it's IPM TV where we are going to basically be the Netflix of indigenous content. And, and, and I think that with that, people are going to see, you know, similar stories, but from indigenous people of the world to know that, you know, the same water fights that we are fighting within, um, and within Standing Rock is the same water fight that, um, there are young, you know, there is people in Africa that is fighting. The same, you know, um, that everyone will begin to start seeing these similarities of, of our of our fights. And then on top of it, of culture, you know, how the drum, how the way that we prepare food. You know, when I was in Costa Rica last month, it was the second time I used my passport. Um, surprisingly, I've only been in America. I've Me never... Too. Yeah, for real, Joseph. Oh, <laughs> I'm state <laughs> found. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I don't, and I, I, I think I've probably been to almost every reservation in in um in America. But I went to Cuba last year, and then um and then I went to Costa Rica. And when I was in Costa Rica, I met with two indigenous tribes that's on the border of Panama, the Bribri tribe. And there's another tribe I, I wish I could remember, but they look like our relatives. I was all like, wow, that looks like my auntie Faith. And that looks like auntie Wilma. That looks like uncle Albert, you know, and I'm looking at them and they, they, I felt at home. I felt was like, wow, these are our relatives, you know, and then, and then when they was, the, when they was explaining to me their origin stories and, and who they are, you have one tribe, I think the, the reason why I remember the Bribri tribe is because they remind me of Lakota people, they are the warriors, you know, they are the warriors, they are the ones that fought, and then the other tribe are, are remind me of Hopis, they're the ones that are very, you know, kind of quiet and in demeanor and talk and they, um, but it was, it was, I was like, oh, wow. You know, they just remind me of home. And I think that these type of stories and this type of content 
um, needs to be shared more. And, and um, in regards to people, we begin to see our similarities and our differences. And so when we talk about the human factor, you know, with indigenous people's movement, with, um, with just the content we put out, you know, we have a lot of white people that go on and they're like, wow, they, they're able to see the human factor of the injustices, whether no matter if they're Republican, Democratic, Independent, no matter what, if you are connected to this earth, and you are here on this earth, then you should be able to feel. And if you do not, then there's something wrong with you. You know, I said this on The Breakfast Club. I said, if you're able to feel when you see a dog being abused, then you should also be able to feel when George Floyd is being choked. Yes. Or to also be able to feel when you're seeing Latino um, migrant workers that are working and slaving every day and having to run um, to hurry up and try to get food that they just pick that th that they are charged for, you know, or you're seeing my um and like um you know as Spanish speaking indigenous young people in these cages. If you are human, you should be able to feel, and if you don't, then you don't belong on this earth. Period. There's something wrong. There's, there's something wrong. You need to go to a, a, a psych ward or something, or yeah. you're you're a lunatic, you know. And 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 I think that's really what we're fighting is is lunatics. <laughs> we're fighting yeah. against <laughs> that are not human. <laughs> you hit on a chord there, you know. If you're able to feel, connect to the earth, but feel that that right there, you know, says a lot. That reverberates through everyone. Like if you see a dog that happened, you know, what you just said about the migrant workers having to run in order to, to make a dime that they can't even afford the food that they're picking, that is just horrifying. And so, uh, you know, to, to have that, that sense of feeling it gets for one another, I think is, is critical. So, you know, looking at that solution, Chase, I, I, it's- And on. you see I'm on the earth right now, look at yeah, this. Yeah, that's- you, we it's can't a, it's a long life. process. We're 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 talking. It took five thousand years to get to this point where they got they got us separated. They got our our, our minds separated from our spirit. Um, you know, we we subscribe to their concept of the self, concept of the ego. We're 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 separated from um, a daily relationship with Mother Earth with with the heavens. Um, the, and for me, I'm just speaking from personally, like just during ceremony time is the only time I get to really come to terms with that. And we're lucky to be able to do that because they put this earth on a grid. When we talk about the black snake, it's not just the oil pipelines. Tim Mintz is, is, the, is, the, is one of Standing Rock's elders who I heard mention that the black snake could also refer to the highway system. That's what it and was. We're, yeah, we're encroaching on the four-legged domain. And we swore to keep our end of the bargain and protect their domain. As a result of our cultural knowledge, our cultural mythology, we, we, I'm talking about the great race around the Black Hills. You know, because the, the metal arc the, or the, the magpie, um, the, the two-legged bird won that race on behalf of two-legged's now we are in this situation where the human species, like as a species, we're, we're the indigenous peoples, the indigenous nations are some of the redeemable potential of what the human species has become. Like, and, and I think people sense that. Seven billion humans are looking at indigenous peoples, indigenous yeah. nations, and I really want to uh, give mad props to indigenous people's movement for making it a global scope because from the reservation, you know, we're very myopic or whatever. Like sometimes we just see what's right in front of us because that's hard enough. It's, it's a struggle just like it is in any other oppressed and targeted area. But indigenous people are the globe over and, and we confront those forces of colonization very directly whether it's at, at Standing Rock or I don't know what, you know, Lumumba, like I just thought of Brother Lumumba when, when you were talking and, and, and Romy over in the Netherlands, you know, with the Malukan people, this indigenous peoples is all over the world. And yeah. IPM, Indigenous Peoples Movement, is doing a, is empowering people's stories. So, I mean, we, we just have to keep rising. 
as a great question that just came in. As indigenous peoples, what can we do to help ourselves in our communities so we're getting out of our comfort zones and excelling in academic and professional environments so we have a seat at the table where decisions are made? We, I think all three of us at some point or, or another have been sitting at those tables and how we were able to participate in that or not, you know, is, is a matter of, of, of taking that experience, building upon it, learning. So when you get back to the table, making the opportunities to get back to the table, to be involved in those circles, educate yourself. <laughs> so that discussion is not just something that you uh, absorb and are an observation as to, but you are a participant in and can have real um, opinion and I don't say policy, but you know, uh, uh, thoughts towards making things better. And to me, it's that making things better, but I'll hand it off to you. I just had to say it while it was in my brain. Yes, yes. I think that one of the things is that uh, I always say, you know, to get out of your comfort zone there, you know, um, put yourself in a place that is outside of who you are. You know, um, you know, we're in March, which is the, the month of Hole. Hole is a, is a spring celebration of the Indian people, the Hindu people. And every year, me and my son, we, um, I Google it because I saw it. Let me just tell you, I saw it on a, uh, a music video with Beyonce. <laughs> and I was like, what are they doing? That looks so much fun. And, um, and I ended up researching it. And now me and my son, um, this year, of course, they're not going to do it because of the fact of COVID. But we went to a whole day celebration where we were just, you know, throwing paint on each other and having great Indian food and all of that, which expanded us to meeting and for my son to also learn about the Hindu culture in Indian people, where he ended up doing more research and he did a, a report on it. I think that it's important to be able to get out of your neighborhood and um, and to be able to learn about other people. Like, you know, we learned this early on Sesame Street, who are the people in your neighborhood? You know, <laughs> saying like, <laughs> And, um, and I think yeah. that that is something very, very important that we have to do is to get out of our neighborhood and get to know the people in the neighborhood, in your city, in your state. And, um, you know, this is the reason why, I mean, even as adults, we need to do field trips. You know, what I'm doing, well, the reason why you see me out and about and why am I in the middle of the woods is because of the fact that I'm getting, I get people out of our comfort zone for revolutionary healing. And we go back into, we go all throughout different places in Atlanta, Georgia, or in the state of Georgia, and get them out of their comfort zone and going out on the land and filling Mother Earth. And then we have different presenters and different people of different backgrounds to be able to teach on different healing mechanisms. And, and I do it on the third Sunday of every month. So the reason why you saw me out is because I'm looking for our new location, because we I always pick a new location in, in Atlanta. And it's crazy if we every... Verizon got I it. lived down the street and I didn't even know that this place is here. This park is here. This is here, you know, and it, and that's getting people out of their comfort zone. So I think that that is really key is to um, and as you go and travel in your city um, and going to different events or even right now, a lot of things are virtual looking and researching of different cultures and to begin to start seeing the similarities. And another thing that I always do is that no matter what space that I'm coming into, if I'm going into a space that is like predominantly black um, led, I always make sure like I'm coming in as a black woman, but I'm also coming in as a native woman. So when I'm in these spaces, I'm like, you're not just going to acknowledge black people because that's beautiful, but I'm also going to demand that you acknowledge native people and that is something that i always do and i feel that um and i and i always and not only do i demand that you acknowledge native people but i also demand that you also acknowledge latinx people and asian people and indian people um and i'm and I, that's the way that i think that's the way that i move when i'm in these spaces so i'm like okay you know and they're like oh i never thought about that i never thought about that and i'm like because you're so caught up in who you are and that's very selfish, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So we have to be able to, so I always make sure, but I always 
push my black activist organizer friends that do not i'm not your token but you also you also need to make sure that native representation is at your event that latinx representation is at your event and the, the list goes on um because of the fact that we're all dealing with the same issues we're all in the same fight together and that's something that i always make sure that that is and, and this goes out to native people you know make sure that you have black representation that you have latino representation I always say, you know, it's not all about you, boo. You know what I'm saying? Like, make sure that you are presenting and um and making it. If we cannot talk about that medicine wheel, we can't talk about that medicine wheel if we're not acknowledging the people of those four directions, oh. period, you know? That's that's true. That's very, so true. Um, you know, as, as you're talking about that, you know, as I'm thinking about here, like in North and South Dakota, it's like them and us. We're lucky if we go to Fargo and more in, in, in Bismarck and maybe Rapid City to see more black folk come up, you know, and more folks of like uh, Indian or Asian uh, descent be there. But for the most part, it's it's them and us. So getting out of our comfort zone is getting right into their zone, which is uncomfortable. They're well, you know what I thought, you know what I, yeah, what I saw when I went to Bismarck was Bismarck has a huge, um, there's a lot of Africans there. Wow. And I saw a lot of very diversity. I was so shocked of how diverse Bismarck is. I was like, wow, this place is diverse. You know? It's coming I, I think it's, yeah. It is. Um, you know, Chase, go ahead. I, yeah, I mean, no, I was just, uh, yeah. Thank you for that, Inaja. I want to, I want to respond to, um, the question about uh, getting out of your comfort zone, I mean, that's that's just kind of a way of life, really. You have to challenge yourself. You have to do things that you might not think you can do, things you might not be comfortable doing. I was never comfortable being a speaker or being on the camera or doing this kind of stuff with all the studio and all that, but it's, it's something that I want to do, it's something that I know I have a responsibility to do and also my wife and my oldest daughter are probably tired of hearing me babble every single day trying to deconstruct the legal, political and economic oppression and, and yada yada yada. So I need like another outlet. So you got to stay in that discomfort zone and, and that's perfectly fine um, for, for how I want to respond to academic and economic pursuits, professional environments, that sort of stuff. The most important thing that we have to remember is that we have to value our knowledge systems, value what we are and who we are, and recognize that what we're learning in school, what they say about black people, what they say about indigenous peoples, it's, it's written by those who want to degrade us and want us to start degrading ourselves. So not everybody has the benefit of learning from a parent who who is trying to liberate their spiritual reality or their minds and 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 we need to redefine what success is to us what poverty is to us even though it's tough times in oppressed places there's also intangibles there is spiritual strength unconquerable dignity there's things there that we can't put a price on and that we need to try to help grow and and so i would say for people who are kind of wondering you know how do we fit into those systems yes you got to go to those schools my daughter tokata she's in college right now mm -hmm. and she recognizes that those are knowledge systems that that aren't coming from us right, that, right. Don't, that don't that don't they don't value indigeneity in fact they try to erase it and so sometimes our students are questioning why do i got to learn all this european eurocentric academic stuff and the the truth is like i had to do that too we all had to do that in those institutions you have to take those shots and recognize that they're trying to undermine what we are and what we represent because we are the truth and we are powerful and they know that and, and so we have to just continue to educate each other and lift each other up tolerate each other even like mm -hmm. we might we don't have to all like each other after, you know, every time I see Yanazda, sometimes I think of going to a powwow. Oh, no. Oh. 
Don't do that, bro. Because <laughs> she, that video, we, we, that video. we experienced that together, and that's like a collective <laughs> trauma on in Indian country now. <laughs> oh, Joseph, have you seen the video? Oh, God, it circulated here. Quick, boy. <laughs> oh, no. Chase, is he a Lala now? <laughs> we got to... <laughs> We I talk about building bridges and and, be, and being a token, you know. We ain't got to go that far. <laughs> that hey, was hilarious. Me, me and Chase both been tokenized, but that was right there was hilarious. Anytime I need a good laugh, I put on that video and just start laughing. <laughs> I could not believe that. I just thought of that when I saw you. I was like, yo, yeah. last time we were in Houston, freaking Yonaja, I played the video. <laughs> <laughs> but yo, um, <laughs> get back to to um, to Tokata. What you mentioned about her going to school, being raised in an indigenous culture, an indigenous heart, indigenous soul, going to school and wondering why do I have to learn these things? You know, the, the question that was asked is getting that seat at the table in professional and academic environments. You know, so I think talking about that with our kids coming up and why am I doing this? Why am I doing that? Because it's going to be a time when you're going to be in a place where everything you know and everything you are is going to be able to impact people and systems, these systems that devalue us, these systems that degrade us, these systems that keep us in a machine so that those that have can continue to have and while keep us in, in, in a place of, of being a consumer you know, I said, God, it feels like I'm a cow. You know, they drive me from here, make me go there, boom, 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 and then I'm dead. And they make me buy this tombstone in a, in a case, wrap me in buffalo skin and drop me in the ground. That's how I'm going to go down. Right. You know, but the laws say that I can't do that. So, you know, when Tokata is going to be in that place of influence because of her education and her upbringing, then that is where that change that influence can really make, you know, an impact coming up. Just thinking about that as, you know, we talk about our kids and, and talk about the systems and why get an education. Why and what do you do at that seat at the table when you get there? You know, it's building those alliances. Just something's coming through my head. I yeah, like shout out to Takasa because she's amazing. I love her so much and she inspires me and pushes me um you you and your you and her mother did an amazing job with her and let her know that i'm here anytime she needs yeah. me i want to kidnap her and have her come down here to atlanta you she, know she she would love it <laughs> covid has has you know we gotta give it up to our children and the younger yeah. people because covid has like rocked their whole world and yeah. they're navigating that this whole existential threat there's like a dread hanging over the globe and and our children are navigating that and they're still able to smile i'll definitely let tokata know she's down the road down there i know i know she is uh and she's yeah. at that age where she's just you know looking for ways to to spring out of the nest and so anyhow yeah, let her um, know we're, we're wide open we're wide open in atlanta <laughs> I mean, we have our mask, but I'm, I'm heading right now to a food truck park. It's all food trucks. Everyone's getting food from the food truck. Wow. And it's, yeah, unfortunate, unfortunately, Atlanta has never, I don't think we ever quarantined like that because um, we have a Republican governor mm -hmm. that doesn't believe there's COVID. But but we, we stay masked up and all of that down here. But yeah, bring her down here. <laughs> you know, one thing I like to like, just let you guys know in this last couple months, I've been involved in a lot of conversations with uh, Native Nations and Renewable Energy, you know, working on their uh, power authorities. And I hear, I thought that maybe there was, was six or seven. I know there's five real established ones and we're working to be an established, well, we are an established power authority here. Um, but, you know, this call that we had with folks um, through DOE and DOI, they're like 30 Native Nations coming up right now with renewable energy projects, power authorities, but also, uh, communities of color, you know, North Carolina, South Carolina, there's a lot of coalitions developing to aggregate their resources so that they can take power to serve their own communities. And so I think, you know, as we talk about not just it, how we relate to one another in, in a sense through struggle and, and identified um, challenges, but, you know, we're looking to help each other in our own communities 
And that is happening organically, even though we're in separate places and separate spaces. So that's just something I want to throw out to you guys, you know, to keep an eye out for and, you know, help cultivate that uh, when you see it and, you know, have that discussions in your circles because it's uh, it's coming up and it's I think it's going to be real impactful. That speaks to our, our economic empowerment. You know, Sage Development Authority is trying to create self-determination in a practical sense, create renewable energy, but there's also hemp. Any anytime a society, a people can can close that loop. Look at we just bleed out money. Look at the black buying power. You know, uh, the boycotts that were that were part of justice or else the black th there is black sovereignty. Look at Black Wall Street, the, yeah. the, 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 the black community and the black American experience, which is, is rooted in, in indigeneity, um, wants to empower itself. So that's the same thing with tribal nations. I've been I've been always at work at, on Standing Rock, on Pine Ridge, even on Cheyenne River trying to create economic empowerment because we we don't have we're not poor we're held in this captive state that's a deliberate thing and I, i'm not saying that as an excuse but we have a hundred miles of shoreline on standing rock cheyenne mm -hmm. river has a hundred miles of the missouri river the largest river system in the country you know joe i know you were you were interested in packaging that water so we could realize economic empowerment from our own resources. This whole country has been looted by those who are still, they've been rich since slavery, since the creation of currency. So economic empowerment will help us redefine what we consider to be progress. Can we drink this water? Can we eat the fish and, and the animals that we hunt or harvest in our own lands? Are they healthy? Are the ecosystems healthy? Those are the, some, of the, some of the areas we're gonna move into as we become more empowered. Agree. And I'm, I'm happy you bring that up. You know, it's getting back into those those places and spaces. One thing about the water, you know, was looking at it, I had to ask myself, I'm going to use plastic, which is petroleum to sell water. It made me stop the whole process and think about what is what are the values right. that we want to put forward, you know, and then finding a, an economic way, you know, to make that work was it wasn't available you know, at that time. So it, it's interesting. You have to find that, and it's not always available, but you have to move forward. Um, how do we achieve, make achievement in, in, in a way that moves our communities ahead um, without, without uh, erasing our values, you know, or approaching that? Uh, we have to be our worst, our own worst critics, our own, you know, best critics, I should say, in that regard. Uh, because we're all colonized. My shirt, my teeth, I got crowns, you know, that's all colonization right there. But I needed a crown or else I'd be looking like a hillbilly sitting here. <laughs> but it, it, it's making the best decisions we can make, you know, for our battle to live in balance with our Nari, with Unchimaka, and, you know, our spirit world, which is our spirit, earth, and, and the stars. So it, it's doing the best you can with what we have. And I really appreciate this conversation again, you know, because it all goes back to um, indigenous communities having that root and that touch to, to light and guide the world moving forward. And I believe that's really true. It's going to be more true uh, in the years coming up. It's important to us to teach our children a spiritual connection uh, when we pass on that they have that same strong root you know, to move ahead to because times I don't think are going to get any easier. You know, these systems aren't giving up because it's the right thing to do. They're going to bleed everything they can out of it. And uh, we have to continue to hold on, you know, for our kids' sake. Oh. Yeah, I think I think also to add on to what um, both of you all are saying is that something that, um, you need money? Um, something that, um, you know, during... Um, black people, we spend one point, I think it's $1.6 trillion a year. That is, that is a lot of money. And um, one thing that, so we, we do have the, we do have the money. 
Um, it just goes down to I feel that you know when I look at when I look at Pine Ridge and I um, we have the we can have the resources and um, if we have a strong business council. And as well as if we are a tribe, then we have to move as a tribe in regards to helping each other out and putting our one thing that, you know, um, that I'm here in Atlanta, right? And I just pulled up at the food, at a food, at a food truck place. It's a parking lot that someone has and all of these food trucks are all black owned. Mm. Every single one of these food trucks are black owned. And they're probably paying a fee to have all of their, their, you know, their food trucks here and or have eating and all of that. And, and that's usually how it is. Nor That's the norm in Atlanta. Mm-hmm. You know, you see a lot of Black-owned businesses. You see a lot of Black-owned banks. Um, everything here is, a, is a lot of it is Black-owned. Mm-hmm. And it's because of the fact of people putting their money together. For instance, um, a friend of mine, um, he was able to do a group um, economics where basically everyone puts their money together to be able to purchase property, whether it's apartment complexes or multi, um, multi-use, thank you, multi-use office space or whatever. And I think that that's what we have to get out of is I, I, I and more into we, we, we. And being able to say, okay, let's, you know, let's put our money together. We have so much land in in South Dakota and North Dakota. All of that land should be utilized, not just for farming, but could be utilized for everything that we need. So we don't have to go to border towns in order for us to be able to, um, I learned, you know, Tom Corbear, may God be pleased with him, my uncle, He said to me before he passed, he was like, it's like a million dollars a month um, that leaves the reservation, you know, in Pine Ridge, a million dollars a month. Imagine if that is staying within our our reservation in Pine Ridge. You know, we could have our own Walmart, but we just need to be able to really see the possibility. So even if coming to Atlanta and, and, and this is the reason why the black and the native communities need to be able to come together to learn, to, to be able, um, because the reason, you know, when we look at Black Wall Street, we look at the Seminole Nation with Hard Rock, you know, those are, those are black and native people that came together, you know, whether it's in their lineage or whether it's from relations, but they came together in order for that. And I think that right there is the number one um, the number one threat to white America is the unity of black and native people because native people, this is our land that they stole from. Right. And then they stole, they stole, um, they stole us as black people from Africa to the land, to a people that already know the land. So they don't want us to know the land as black people. They don't want us to be able to benefit off the land with native people. So that's why they put native Americans on reservations that are so far removed from the inner city. And so for white people to continue to govern and master, you know, to be our so-called masters next to them within inner city. And this is the reason why we have to get off the grid, get off the, you know, always say I made an article in the final call newspaper. I said, this, I said, are you ready to get off the plantation? And, and to be able to learn about, you know, living off the land from native people. And we have to be able to, this, our, our unity is going to be um, very, very powerful. And, 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 and this is why I'm always threatened on social media and from government officials and all of that is because I'm always talking about black and native unity. It's important, it's vital um, for our freedom and for our justice and for our equality. I appreciate that. And, and I want to thank you both for being with us again. We, we're, we're getting to a point where I, everybody's walking off because it's three o'clock. And, uh, but I want to thank you, you know, for, for the time, for helping bring Sage, you know, back to, to the front and discussing, you know, our issues. Because I think it's important that we're not just talking about a wind farm to help Standing Rock do this, but we're also talking about connections that we all have. It's important for us to change the world. And so what we're doing here at Standing Rock with the Sage Development Authority with the wind farm is creating this wind farm so we can change the economic and and community uh, abilities and build here at home through our own hand. So these are things that we want to put out there for other communities to take a look at what we're doing. Give us a call, you know, donate and help us to raise this up so that we can 
make this model that everyone else can use as well. You know, so I want to appreciate everybody for, for coming and joining us, uh, for taking the time, making the time, and, and don't forget to donate with us. Our tribe is still fighting the uh, pipeline at standingrocksuetribe.org. And then, of course, us at sagesrst.org, you know, drop a few bucks and help us keep the, uh, the project going and, and making it work. We are scrapping it out. It, it's not, a, you know, an easy thing to do. And it's to the help of everybody that's joining us on these calls. And of course, uh, you Chase and you Nasda, you know, for bringing the message and uh, this connection, you know, for us, uh, through us, by us, to us. Holy smokes, I need a pulpit. Mm. But I'll give you guys some last words, last things to say. And I just want to say thank you. Wopi Latanka. Chase? I would just say thank you too for tuning in thank you for doing this uh check out sage development authority standing rock nation uh all of our tribal nations are, are trying to change yeah. our outlook and claw our way out of those environments that were created for us to fail in they didn't mm -hmm. have our prosperity in mind and it's the same for the black indigenous or black communities in our country we the the the, the power structures are not going to give up power without a struggle. And you, we also have to realize that there's more non-racist white people that are on our side. It's not all the, the Trumps and the Steve Bannons, the Steve Millers and the Proud Boys. That is a very fringe minority that is constantly popping up at the mouth, threatening race wars and civil wars. They do not want that smoke. They are a fringe minority. And so all of our allies who are not racist, who might be white or identify as white, we're all on the same side as we go forward. We have to create a new social contract in our country. Oh. Yes, I, um, um, thank you. And thank you once again for having, for having this. Um, this is important. These conversations need to be had. Um, Joseph, so I really appreciate you. Um, everyone continue to follow if you're not Indigenous Peoples Movement on all of the amazing things that we're, um, we're a part of. We're a coalition-based organization. So Chase and Joseph is family to Indigenous Peoples Movement. And, and so we just wanna, wanna continue to unite our people. You know, I think it's really important. That's the only way that we're gonna be able to get through the next several years. And um, is unity. Unity is very, very powerful. And then we have to continue to push and fight for unity. So um, yeah, and you can follow me, Yanajaha. I'm the only Yanajaha in the world. So um, follow me on social media and, um, and, and I'll always be there. And I want to see you all at Revolutionary Healing on the third Sunday of every month in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, it's, we, have, we have built also a, an Anipia sweat lodge um, that we have ceremony the night before, um, which has been really good. It's, a, it's I believe we're the only Anipi here in Georgia. So it's really good that people come and to experience, you know, they say that when um, the Cherokee people and the Choctaw, they're like, there is none out here. And, and, and I'm seeing that as we're doing revolutionary healing, there's a lot of natives that are popping out and saying, wow, something built seems familiar, you know? Yeah. And um, <laughs> so it's good to, that we're having that. And then as well as, you know, there's so many black people that have native in their lineage that they've been wanting to be able to reconnect. So revolutionary healing has also been that source of getting back to the indigenous roots of who we are as well. So and did um, so the revolutionary healing dot com um, follow us and um, and Joseph and Chase and and uh, Joseph, you and your wife, y'all need to come down. You guys and you, you all need to come down to Atlanta. And um, I take you out to the Trap Museum. <laughs> oh, all right. <laughs> By T.I., the, the Trap Museum and, and all of the other amazing things that, that Atlanta has to offer. You know, um, Killer Mike called it uh, Wakanda. You know nope. what I'm saying? So, there it is. There so it is. I, I, I show y'all <laughs> the, the Wakanda. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all for, for being here. I greet everyone uh, on, our, on our way out. And... Uh, you guys have a great day out there. Thanks for joining us. See us at sagesrst.com, .org, .twitter, .facebook, .ig, .forehead, not feathers. Yeah. 
Oh, God. <laughs> All right, guys. Have a good day. Okay, Later. you too.